Greetings, listeners, and thank you for joining me once again as we celebrate stories and storytelling in all their forms and the bards and artists who bring them all to life. I am the Tale Collector and your host, Erica Adams. I've been making up stories in my mind since childhood, though I seldom put them to paper. It wasn't until high school that I really began to write seriously and regularly in my spare time, nor was it until my sophomore year that I found a teacher who took that writing just as seriously. Enter Mrs. Lloyd, 10th grade English. Upon learning about my auditory processing disorder, she gave me a very special gift. Reach for the Moon, a book of poems by Samantha Abiel. Like me, Abiel had a learning disability that severely hindered her in school, but she found solace and strength in the act of writing. Mrs. Lloyd later gave me another gift. I'd once mentioned to her that I was growing increasingly fond of this New Age Celtic artist from my Pure Mood CD collection. Imagine my delighted surprise when she gave me two of said artist's CDs to keep. Turns out she was a longtime fan. And so, Mrs. Lloyd, this one's for you. Please allow me to present Lorena McKennett, performing from 1985 to 98, and then from 2006 to 2019, and recommended for listeners 13 and up. A lady born of Irish and Scottish descent in Morden, Manitoba, McKennett originally studied veterinary medicine, but opted instead to become a musician upon discovering artists like Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, and Gordon Lightfoot. Her passion further blossomed when she traveled to Ireland to hear authentic Celtic music for herself. From there, she took up busking around Canada to pay for the recording of her first album. As of 2018, she has released 10 studio albums and 6 live albums under her own label, Quinlan Road, and provided music for TV shows like Highlander The Series and Legacy, documentaries like Full Circle, Women in Spirituality, and movies like The Mists of Avalon and Tinkerbell, just to name a few. She's received many Grammy nominations and Juno wins, as well as Billboard's International Achievement Award in 1997, and even performed the opening ceremonies at the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympics. But it's not only her music that's made her so distinguished. In 1998, she founded the Cook Reese Memorial Fund for Water Search and Safety. Following the tragic drowning of her fiancé, Ronald Reese, his brother Richard, and their close friend, Gregory Cook, in a boating accident, hence McKennett's 98-06 hiatus. She donated all of the $3 million profits from her then-latest album, Live in Paris and Toronto, to the fund. Moreover, on top of being an honorary doctor of many fields from various Canadian universities, she is also a member of the Orders of Canada and Manitoba, a recipient of Queen Elizabeth's Golden and Diamond Jubilee Medals and the Canadian Forces Decoration, and a Knight of France's Order of Arts and Letters. I believe this love and respect for her fellow man and their stories is a driving force behind the noble grace of McKennett's songs. Besides her skill with the piano, harp, and accordion, her dramatic soprano vocals ebb and flow from soft and whispery to powerful and operatic, resulting in a voice filled with dignity and compassion. Her inspiration is firmly grounded in real-world history and culture, an authenticity which makes the quality of her music all the more majestic and haunting. The ways in which McKennett pays such tribute comes in many lyrical and thematic forms. Her earlier albums are comprised almost entirely of covers of traditional Irish, Scottish, and English folk songs. Her mature yet spirited inflections make her sound as if she herself lived and breathed and sang during those ancient times. From Blacksmith, a boisterous song belying a tale of love found and love spurned, to the Wexford Carol, as glorious and humbling as the nativity it praises. I'm particularly fond of her homages to the finest poets and writers in Western literature, in the form of her setting their written pieces to music, partly because I'm always reminded of my British poetry and romanticism courses in college whenever I hear them. Her rendition of Stolen Child by William Butler Yeats is filled with as much maternal warning as bedtime story fantasy. Alfred Tennyson's The Lady of Shalott, she treats with the slow, somber beauty of a funeral befitting the tragic life and death of its title maiden and with sensual use of guitar and violin and the galloping beat of a dashing desperado, she fully captures the olden day intrigue and romance of Alfred Noyce's The Highwayman. In the mid-90s and the early 2000s, McKennett began to broaden her geographical horizons and her musical ones along with them. Her extensive travels and experiences through Spain, Morocco, Greece, and other Mediterranean countries add a fresh spice that complements rather than clashes with her traditional Celtic sound. But more than that, they celebrate the country's respective cultures and the people who shape their histories. I find this quality exceptionally strong in her instrumental pieces. For example, she plays for us the story of Marco Polo, the famed Venetian merchant whose explorations opened the eyes of Europe to the mysteries of Asia and beyond and Keheratomene, a Greek word meaning full of grace, is the name of the convent in which Anna Komnene, an 11th century princess and writer who painstakingly chronicled the history of the Byzantine Empire, spent her final days. 
But like all journeys, when one begins, another inevitably ends. In October 2019, McKenna had officially announced that she is stepping away from music production indefinitely in order to spend time with her family and to focus on efforts to fight global warming and to address the harmful effects of technology, even going so far as to quit Facebook the year before. I commend her for facing and discussing these serious issues, as we threaten to lose sight of our Earth and each other with the world's ever-increasing reliance on technology. Whether or not we hear new songs from her in the future, I wish her the very, very best. In the Jim Henson's The Storyteller episode, Hands My Hedgehog, there is a line repeated throughout that describes the title character's bagpipe music. Quote, It was a sound both bitter and sweet, beginning in hello and ending in goodbye. If there is a real-life musician that embodies this sentiment, it's Lorena McKennett. With her elegant singing, she invites and greets with open arms. With her passionate playing, she bids a fond and poignant farewell. Showing great respect for other musical styles outside her ancestral one, she creates a beautifully unique New Age sound all her own. But more importantly, she uses that very sound to preserve the legacies and honor the rights of all mankind, whose emotions, desires, and questions are universally shared regardless of ethnicity and era. Every one of her songs is its own pilgrimage, as much a spiritual experience of humanity as a sonic excursion into antiquity. Gather around next time for another tale you may have forgotten or have never heard before. Until then, listeners, may inspiration always find you. Greetings, fair listeners, and thank you for joining me once again as we celebrate stories and storytelling in all their forms and the bards and artists who bring them all to life. I am the Tale Collector and your host, Erica Adams. Human ingenuity has served us well over the centuries. Advances in technology have offered a plethora of new frontiers for us to explore, the means with which to ensure our survival, and the ability to discover and create wonders unlike anything seen in antiquity. However, many would argue that all this comes at the great cost of cultural, religious, and individual identity. At what point does technological progress become destructive to the natural order of life? At what point does clinging to ancestral traditions become detrimental to physical health and social and emotional development? Can a balance between past and future be struck? If so, how? It's hard enough for adults to answer these questions, much less children, especially those hailing from places which embrace the technology of today, but whose ethnic and theological roots date back thousands of years. Case in point, a country as ancient as Africa, in a time as radical as the turn of the 23rd century. As we see in Nancy Farmer's The Ear, The Eye, and The Arm, first published in 1994 and recommended for readers 10 and up. <laughs> The streets of 2194 Zimbabwe are infested with crime and ruled by merciless gangs ravenous for money and blood, something General Amadeus Matsika knows all too well. But he rules his household with the same iron fist he does his military forces, something his 13-year-old son, Tendai, knows all too well. Tired of his father's constant criticism and stifling homeschool regime, Tendai, along with his impulsive little sister, Rita, and carefree little brother, Kuda, sneak away from their fortified mansion to explore the city streets in freedom, only to be kidnapped by the henchmen of the greedy child trafficker, the She-Elephant. 
When the police are stimmied, the general tries a different tactic. Emphasis on the word different. Enter Africa's three finest and strangest detectives, ear, eye, and arm, so named due to nuclear waste heightening their respective physical senses to superhuman levels. And so the trio of mutant sleuths set out to find and rescue the Matsika children, not only from the common and not-so-common criminals who would hold them for ransom, but also the masks, the deadliest gang in Zimbabwe, who have their own far more sinister plans for them. Though not the only book I've read that highlights African tradition, this is the first I've read that falls under the category of Afrofuturism, a subgenre of science fiction and an artistic movement which incorporates elements and aesthetics of African diaspora culture in themes of science and technology. Farmer, a U.S. citizen born in Phoenix, Arizona in 1941, worked in Mozambique and Rhodesia, or present-day Zimbabwe, upon enlisting in the Peace Corps in 1963. Within the fast-paced thrills of her futuristic world, complete with flying cars, laser guns, and robots, she weaves a comprehensive but manageable crash course in African history and culture. Names and vocabulary terms are italicized throughout the text, and there is a glossary at the end of the book to define them more clearly. Farmer also includes an appendix in which real-world customs, beliefs, events, and even the myriad tribes of Africa touched upon in the story are explained more in depth for any curious readers. Ironically, and sadly, all Tendai, Rita, and Kuda know of their country is what they've been taught from books and tutors, with no hands-on experience whatsoever beyond the security of their house. Their father even mentions at one point that they've never ridden on a bus before. In the outside world, the three are practically tourists themselves in their own native Africa. Almost everything they see in the markets, from the traditional wares to the high-tech, though shady, merchandise, is as exotic to them as it is to us. Pages 32 to 33. Long sunshades covered the various markets. Each street was devoted to a different product. Fruits, vegetables, clothes, crockery, and soap. Meat sellers slapped sides of beef to dislodge flies and show off their wares. Nyanga squatted before heaps of roots and herbs. They wore feathered caps banded with wild cat fur and smoked long pipes as they dozed in the heat. There were even a few public mellowers. Each praise singer had his own booth with a comfortable couch. When someone felt depressed and needed a quick praise, he gave the mellower a brief rundown of his best points. The person would lie down on the couch while the praise singer created a poem about him. Tendai realized he was happy, and he hadn't known he was sad before. He liked the noise and the smells, both good and bad, and the faces, both innocent and crafty. He liked being surrounded by people. He liked them all in their shapes and dispositions, simply because they were people and not machines. Look, cried Kuda. They were walking along the animal pens. Vendors haggled over goats and chickens. Fancy showcats yawned contemptuously at the crowds that milled around them. But on a table at the end, all by itself, sat a most amazing creature. It was blue. Its fur stood out in a handsome ruff around its face, and its tail hung down almost to the ground. It wore a leather collar attached to a chain. Its owner, who had a surprising number of bandages on various parts of his body, sat glumly in a chair and smoked a cigarette. That's a genetically engineered monkey, said Tendai in wonder. I thought they were illegal, Rita said. They are. The blue monkey reached out a long arm and snatched the cigarette from its owner's mouth. The man tried to retrieve it, but the monkey bared its teeth at him. It calmly began to puff on the cigarette itself. What are you staring at, roach face? It snarled. It talks, Rita cried. Of course I do, when I have someone worth talking to. Not him. The blue monkey spat in the direction of its owner. Two other men had stopped at the table. One of them flicked a peanut at the animal. When I want a peanut, I'll go to the market and buy one, shouted the monkey in a rage. Give me a hamburger, you tightwads. The men laughed. This is also the only relatively mature novel I know of whose author, a Caucasian, not only portrays the beauty and dignity of this ethnic group in a comprehensive and fascinating way, but does so without resorting to the tragic theme of racism, which I have to say is quite refreshing. If there is one mature subject this story does explore, though, it's social class. The kids experience the more impoverished side of the city firsthand, but their parents are forced in their own way to see it as well. When they meet ear, eye, and arm for the first time, it's not only the trio's bizarre outward appearances that catch them off guard. Mother begins to realize just how ignorant she is regarding the less privileged, while the general gets his first lesson in how looks aren't everything when it comes to strength. Pages 49 to 51. I removed his dark glasses, and Ear took off his muffs. The three men stood in front of Mother and let her take a long look. Ear, who was white, unfolded his ears. They opened out like huge flowers, pink and almost transparent. I, who was brown, blinked his huge eyes, which were all pupil inside and no white. Arm, who could just as well have been called Leg, stretched out his long, black limbs. He reminded Mother of a wall spider. How... 
how did it happen? She asked. Arm replied, We all come from the village of Huangge, near the nuclear power plant. Oh yes, said Mother. That's where the plutonium got into the drinking water. Our mothers drank it. Mother stared at them. She knew about the accident, of course, in a distant sort of way. A few people died. Others got sick, but it had happened long ago. What must it have been like to have such babies? Hers had been so beautiful. Our parents were delighted when they found out what we could do, said I, blinking in a slow, unnerving way. I could see a flea clinging to a hawk's feathers. My mother never lost anything. I could hear an ant creeping up in a sugar bowl, boasted Ear. And what could you do, said Mother, bewildered by these strange creatures? I got hunches, Arm said. I used to know when the baboons were planning to raid the fields. So you see, we were ideally suited to be detectives. Who are these people, growled Father from the doorway. Ear closed his ears at once. Arm staggered back as though struck. Detectives, Mother replied. They're going to look for the children. Hmm. <laughs> Father stalked around ear, eye, and arm, looking them over. They wouldn't get into the army, he concluded. They have special abilities. Mother hastily explained what these were. Hmm, <laughs> said Father. Only Mother could tell the difference between the two humphs. <laughs> the second meant he was actively interested in the men and was considering using their services. You're hired, he said abruptly. Then he quickly produced pictures of the children, credit cards, maps of the city with phone numbers of the police stations, his own private number to be used day or night, and a great deal of advice. Almost before they knew it, ear, eye, and arm were handed their Nirvana guns and herded back to the limo. Use the bus for business, father said. You'd scare witnesses away with the limo. Report to me six times a day. Good luck. He shook hands with each detective, but paused and raised his eyebrows when he touched arm. That arm has the funniest handshake said Father, watching the shadows creep across the grass. He's stronger than he looks, too. As exciting and fantastic as farmer's descriptions are, they are not overly romantic. At one point, the kids find themselves in Rest Haven, a village deliberately cut off from the modern world in order to, quote, preserve the spirit of Africa. Farmer could have easily fallen back on the attractive, noble savage cliché here, showing off the strong, handsome inhabitants living off the land and treasuring the ancestral customs, in contrast to the supposed ugly, lazy, selfish jerks of the cold, dirty city. But to her credit, she isn't afraid to show both sides of both coins. The people of Rest Haven are also male-dominant to the point of misogyny and superstitious to the point of murder, or so the kids see it. Farmer is always careful to remain objective in her informative narration, even when her characters are anything but. Pages 156 to 159. They think twins are caused by witchcraft, said Rita. There's a good twin and an evil one they have to get rid of. The midwives decided to take the boy out to Garikei and leave the girl alone with a midwife. You understand? Tend I did. I heard them say it was important for the baby to be quiet. If she cried, everyone would know she existed. They couldn't pretend she was stillborn. But everyone knew, said Tendai. Of course. Rita shivered again. It's like the hamburgers we ate at home, she explained. We know a cow died to provide them, but we don't like to think about it. We pretend they come out of the pantry. Well, the villagers pretend the evil baby was born dead. She yawned. Her speech was getting slurred. How did you save it? urged Tendai. They all went out except Chippo, who was too weak to stand, and one old woman. She got a handful of ashes to fill the baby's mouth. My wee! I bopped her on the head with a pot, grabbed the baby, and pinched her. She howled then all right. They couldn't pretend she wasn't alive. The door opened and Mianda came in. She inspected Rita before sitting down. We have to talk, she said in a low voice. I don't know why I'm bothering to do this. You certainly don't deserve any help. Tendai didn't say he was sorry. He wasn't. You don't know what a serious mistake Rita made. In the city, we think killing babies is a mistake, Tendai said. In the city, they kill babies all the time with poverty and crime. You're so stupid. You haven't been here two weeks and already you dare to judge us. Rest Haven is a living culture. You can't pick out the bits you like and throw away the rest. It all works together. Tendai turned his back. He didn't even try to be polite. Mayanda spun him around with her big hands. 
Listen to me, you fool. I know what it's like outside the wall. I was born there. Almost no one is allowed into Rest Haven, but I made it because I understood what it meant. It's whole in a way the city never is. Tendai nodded, remembering the storytelling at the Dare and the feeling of righteousness about the wood smoke. He remembered being carried home in triumph after the fight with Headbuster. You can't yank out part of the pattern and not damage the rest, said Mayanda. Even the part about killing babies? Even that. Many of the finest fictional stories are those which paint an authentic picture of a real-life place for its made-up characters to inhabit. But to make that picture as engaging as those characters and their adventures, that is truly an art and a skill. The ear, the eye, and the arm offers plenty of alien-like creatures, impossible wonders, and high-tech fare to satisfy any sci-fi fan, but it never loses touch with the rich and vibrant heritage of the country they and the more normal individuals call home. Yet as academic as it gets, Farmer's novel still feels very human. With each immediate danger they face and every way of life they are exposed to, its protagonists, young and old, ordinary and extraordinary, take the time to question their own previously held beliefs and learn when to respect the beliefs of others, whether to challenge them, and how they all have the power to shape life itself. For while there is no such place as utopia, the world, when seen in the right light, can be just as incredible. Gather round next time for another tale you may have forgotten or have never heard before. Until then, listeners, may inspiration always find you. Greetings, fair listeners, and thank you for joining me once again as we celebrate stories and storytelling in all their forms and the bards and artists who bring them all to life. I am the Tale Collector and your host, Erica Adams. Warning, this story contains mature themes regarding sexuality. Listener and researcher discretion is advised. My first piece of theater experience came in the fifth grade when I played the role of Kanga in Winnie the Pooh. The costume was sweltering, the tail alone felt like half my body weight, and literally 99.9% .9 of my lines consisted of nothing except, quote, my precious little Rue. Still, I had enough fun to join as the curtain puller for Charlotte's Web the following year. My second came in college, when I volunteered to help backstage for the December 2010 production of White Christmas at the Duluth Playhouse. If those times taught me anything, it's that what occurs behind the curtain can be just as interesting, if not more, than what happens in front of it. I was reminded of this upon seeing what has since become one of my favorite plays superbly performed by the UMD Theatre Department. I can't properly discuss the story and play form since I can only experience it as such once, but I can discuss the next best thing, the movie. I present to you, Stage Beauty, released in 2004 and rated R for sexual content and language. Of all the women to swoon and scream and die on the 17th century London stage, there is no man who does so more beautifully than Ned Keniston. Specializing in exclusively playing female characters, Keniston thrives on the cheers of his bedazzled audience as the tragic Desdemona of Shakespeare's Othello, as well as the attention of the admirers, both male and female, seduced by his feminine charms. But unbeknownst to him, his assistant, Mariah, yearns to act professionally herself in spite of the Puritan law which forbids it. Word of her growing popularity from her underground tavern performances eventually reaches the ears of none other than King Charles II, 
So intrigued is he by the very idea that he decrees that henceforth not only can women now legally become employed actresses, but it will now be illegal for male actors to play roles of the opposite sex. This puts Keniston in a terrible position. Now out of work and unable to convincingly act the role of a male, Keniston's career and social standing are all but destroyed. With the unlikely help of Mariah, now London's most prominent actress, Keniston strives to reclaim his former glory on the stage by learning to act like the man he is. Jeffrey Hatcher's 1999 play on which this film is based, Complete Female Stage Beauty, was in turn inspired by the extensive writings of Samuel Pepys, administrator for the English Navy and a member of Parliament. In his private diary, he made several references to real-life actor Edward Kiniston, one of the last of what were called boy players, young male actors who regularly played females, and whom Peep said was, quote, the loveliest lady that ever I saw in my life. That being said, stage beauty concerns itself less with historical accuracy than with engaging its audience, the very definition of theater. According to director Richard Eyre on the DVD commentary, the play acting within the film was actually an invented combination of the acting common in 1600s Britain and Japanese kabuki, resulting in a style that is heavily expressive and reliant on gesturing and physical motion. And speaking of heavy expression, there are few characters here that aren't as dramatic as those upon the stage they so adore. I think their particular traits are lended further strength by the casting as well. I remember Rupert Everett best from his role as Oberon in Michael Hoffman's 1999 adaptation of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream. He brings a similar aloofness, passive aggression, and love of personal pleasure to Charles II. Sir Charles Sedley may lack the blustering short-fuse temper Harry Potter's Vernon Dursley was given by the late Richard Griffiths, but this is made up for by the same pompous and entitled attitude with a girth to match. But Keniston is by far the most theatrical character in every sense of the word. Being 36 at the time, Billy Crudup brilliantly puts both the boy and the player in his boy-player protagonist, who in turn puts a rather promiscuous spin on the concept of method acting. Kiniston is extremely proud of his ability to use his apparent bisexuality to his advantage when it comes to entertaining his devoted fans in his female guise. But he is also selfish, spoiled, and narcissistic, going so far as to not only casually throw his groupie's honor to the wolves, but immaturely prank said wolves with the hidden manhood under his dress. Naturally, Keniston scoffs at the idea of women acting. Like any other supposedly difficult task, playing a woman's role is a man's job, he says, an idea Iyer laughingly calls, quote, magnificently absurd. But this rejection goes deeper than the mindset of male superiority. Keniston brags about all the training he endured and all the tricks he learned to become a woman, which he deludes himself into believing makes him a better expert on womanhood than the real thing, his five positions of feminine subjugation speech being especially cringeworthy. In his mind, there is neither skill nor novelty in a woman playing a woman, because a woman is what she already is. It is by becoming what one is not by nature that marks the versatile genius of a true actor. But the new law strips Keniston naked in ways that have nothing to do with costumes and makeup. It was as a woman that he had felt empowered and whole. When that's taken away and he permanently becomes an ordinary man again, he is revealed for the sham he is, unwanted and unloved now that the illusion has vanished. What's worse, having been what he isn't on the stage for so long, he doesn't know anymore who or even what he actually is in real life, nor does he initially have the courage to face that harsh truth. During the distressing scene in which the Duke of Buckingham, his secret lover, vehemently spells that out for him, Kiniston's teary-eyed expression is that of a naive child child whose playtime fantasy bubble has burst. His fall from grace is truly complete when he tries to recite Othello's lines, a male's lines, before the royal court, only for him to break down like a rank amateur with the worst stage fright. And yet it is Mariah, the new star of London, the one who had suffered Keniston's bullying and took away his spotlight, who remains his one true friend. Thanks in part to a pragmatic performance by Claire Danes, Mariah is arguably the only real character in this entire movie. She wants to be a serious actress because it brings her joy, not to make her former master suffer, and she does show genuine guilt and concern upon witnessing his downward spiral. But she is neither a dumb fangirl nor a suck-up. She is the mother figure and teacher the childish Kiniston so desperately needs, now rubbing his failure in his face, but unafraid to admonish him for his faults. As much as Mariah wishes to emulate the skill of the man she admires, it is that very skill which fuels her frustration toward him. Even in his finest performances, never once had he portrayed a woman realistically. His way was that of a doll, airy and attractive, but lifeless and unnatural. 
Just because actors pretend doesn't mean their characters should. They should feel and act like the live human beings they truly are in all their real and ugly glory, not just toss their heads and die beautifully. I wouldn't call stage beauty a paradoxical or ironic story so much as a story full of paradoxes and ironies. What could have been just a long string of Shakespearean tongued gay jokes or a tedious soap opera among promiscuous British royals and stage play actors is instead a funny, evocative, and fascinating study of preconceived gender roles and sexual identity as seen through the surreal but enlightening lens of theater. Just as the bard himself called men and women merely players on the stage we call the world, our parts and lines are constantly being dictated by the social standards around us. But oftentimes, it takes more than a single role to establish one's true character. Gather around next time for another tale you may have forgotten or have never heard before. Until then, listeners, may inspiration always find you. Greetings listeners, and thank you for joining me once again as we celebrate stories and storytelling in all their forms and the bards and artists who bring them all to life. I am the Tale Collector and your host, Erica Adams. Warning, this story contains graphic depictions of violence and death toward a child. Listener and researcher discretion is advised. In his most famous novel, The Alchemist, Paulo Coelho gave this quote through his title character, Everything that happens once can never happen again but everything that happens twice will surely happen a third time. So what does such a philosophical statement have to do with an indie puzzle platform video game set in a dark and horrifying dystopian world? Well, I'll tell you. I was motivated to buy an Xbox 360 for the sole purpose of playing Limbo, another indie puzzle platform video game set in a dark and horrifying dystopian world, the first by the Danish independent developer Playdead and one of my all-time favorite games. As fate would have it, and I swear I absolutely did not plan this, it was Playdead's second game which prompted me to open up a Steam account so that I could play it on my PC without paying an arm and a leg. Of course, I've purchased and played many more excellent games on both systems since then. But I can't help but smile when I wonder, if and when Playdead releases their third game, in development as of 2017, will I go three for three, buy it and play it first on yet another system? Only time will tell. But until then, that second game will certainly tide me over, just as Limbo did before it. Let us now venture inside. Released July 7th, 2016, and rated M for Mature, for blood and gore and strong violence against a minor. There is no life in the forest. Still leaves litter the ground like corpses. Sickly streaks of sunlight bring no warmth to the cold gray air, and even the wind seems reluctant to disturb the eerie silence. All of a sudden, something rustles from atop a lonely crag. A figure drops to the ground, a boy in a red shirt. He races through the woods. Whether from danger or toward salvation, he does not say. But he is not as alone as he first appears. Men with rifles and dogs stand watch, ready to hunt the boy down should he be spotted. He soon discovers they are part of an organization which performs dangerous mind control experiments, reducing their human guinea pigs to zombified automatons devoid of all will and identity. Having now found himself in the heart of their hellish facility, the boy must uncover the purpose of these insane experiments while surviving murderous watchmen, vicious traps, and emotionless scientists, lest he and his own mind become their next research specimens. 
It's near impossible to discuss this game without comparing it to its predecessor, but considering how good the latter turned out, and how the former improved on its format, I am not complaining in the slightest. True, certain core details are identical. A small child finds himself in a hostile and frightening world, alone and pursued by enemies for reasons the player and possibly the protagonist himself don't know. Once again, the narrative is experienced only through play. There is no dialogue or text to give context to the game's setting, a purpose for the boy being there in the first place, or motives for the enemies so dead set on capturing or killing him. Controls are simplified to move, jump, and interact, holding, pushing, and pulling, etc. And just as the limbo boy had his face hidden in black silhouette, save for his bright white eyes, the inside boy has no face at all, an artistic detail that just as strongly adds to the mystery of his identity and backstory. The death traps are just as plentiful and gruesome this time around, and oftentimes, unfortunately, must be experienced firsthand in order for players to understand what not to do in order to progress and survive. So much for the superficial similarities. Inside could easily be nicknamed Limbo 2.0, but it is no clone by any stretch. To begin with, rather than monochrome shadow puppet visuals in 2D, this side-scroller is in 2.5D with color, putting every physical, unnerving detail on full display. Whereas his Limbo counterpart was like a paper doll in both appearance and motion, the inside boy looks and feels much more natural. From the way he stumbles while running from an enemy, to the way he doubles over and pants heavily from exhaustion after swimming for his life. That's a new feature too, not drowning the instant his head is submerged. The aforementioned color is very muted and washed out to maintain the bleak atmosphere. Even the boy's distinctive red shirt barely stands out as more than a dirty brown-hued gray in areas not brightly lit. But that doesn't make his myriad death scenes any less horrifying. Whether he's being mauled by savage dogs, shot or strangled by guards, tased by robots, or drowned by the black-haired ring-esque nymph-like creature haunting the facility's watery depths. A fun fact regarding returning composer Martin Stig Anderson's approach to Inside's eerie sounds. Rather than a traditional soundtrack, Anderson instead created the game's ambient music, as sparse as that of Limbo, by filtering his score through a human skull. Yes, a real human skull. The resulting vibrations serve a dual purpose. The low and somber chords linger oppressively, as if to smother the boy's hope of respite. At the same time, they complement the artificiality of this dystopian world while emphasizing its sheer monstrousness. They don't accompany the technological environment so much as merge with it, creating an unseen but very much live entity in which the boy is little more than a fragile flesh-and-bone insect. One particular musical portion intrigued me. Recall, all you Limbo players, the sequence in which the wide-eyed, shadow-clad boy must make his way past laser-activated machine guns. The music played then is arguably, and rather ironically, the most relaxing and peaceful in the whole game. In fact, the piece has since been unofficially titled by fans, Machine Gun Tranquility. Anderson does something similar in the latter half of one of the most infamous and lethal sections of Inside. Here, the boy finds himself within a massive atrium in which an unseen device in the distance sends out powerful shockwaves which will blast him apart if he is unshielded. In a strangely beautiful juxtaposition, we hear another ambient piece that flows with a calm, dreamlike, and I dare say even uplifting serenity, as if to mock the boy with a false sense of security while lying in wait to strike when he is at his most exposed. Speaking of bringing life from the dead, Limbo briefly touched upon the idea of mind control in the form of the brain slugs which would latch into the boy's head and negate the player's ability to move freely. Inside takes this to a much more sinister level. Despite the futuristic setting, the mindless drones of this game are much more reminiscent of the zombies of old. The original zombie of Hadean lore, though also a walking corpse, was not a flesh-craving monster spawned from pathogens or radioactivity, but instead a docile human shell reanimated via voodoo for the express purpose of slavery, requiring little nourishment and no rest or compensation. The inside zombies are just as harmless and resilient, but also as creepy, with their slumped posture, sloppy gait, and monotonous grunting. As cruel as it seems, the boy must use these unfortunate creatures to progress via a mind control helmet. While he wears it, the player may control one or multiple test subjects to help the boy move heavier objects or toss them to higher areas. We never learn exactly how this fate had befallen them, nor whether they're even aware of what's happened to them, but the disturbing results speak for themselves. They are puppets of flesh that exist only to do the bidding of another, nothing more. In this world I think George Orwell would appreciate, the choice of making the humans' faces literally blank is as disquietingly symbolic as it is fascinating. It suggests that the boy and the test subjects are little more than objects to be owned and manipulated rather than living, breathing human beings to be loved and respected. 
As for the scientists and the apparent ruling class that oversees the experiments, all of whom are seen wearing face-concealing masks, it indicates a severe lack of empathy and a cold, calculating mentality toward their fellow man. And get this, in some shots, they even have children and babies, also masked, among their ranks. A subtle, but brilliantly evil touch. A lack of information does not equal a lack in personal connection. A lesson Play Dead once again teaches us in spades. Inside is more than a worthy successor to another acclaimed title and a smooth and polished game in its own right. It utilizes and embodies many, if not all, of the best aspects of the horror genre. Beautifully eerie visuals, a relentlessly dark atmosphere, a reliance on slow, lingering dread rather than cheap jump scares, a twist ending I can guarantee you will not see coming. And best of all, a wordless and ambiguous narrative that stirs the imagination, revealing only just enough to feel discussion as to the meaning behind this game's mysterious world. Not to mention that grim, all-consuming question of just how much control the player has over their own destiny, assuming they even have control over their own actions, or their very selves, to begin with. Gather around next time for another tale you may have forgotten or have never heard before. Until then, listeners, may inspiration always find you. Greetings, listeners, and thank you for joining me once again as we celebrate stories and storytelling in all their forms and the bards and artists who bring them all to life. I am the Tale Collector and your host, Erica Adams. I'd like to dedicate this episode to a dear friend of mine, Aaron, who single-handedly rekindled my love for science fiction. Ironically, Star Wars was what had killed that love in the first place. As a kid, I thought it was boring with a capital B. As an adult, I do appreciate its place in cinematic history, but I consider it absurdly overrated. If not for Aaron, I might never have given its rival a chance. Now I too will boldly go for Gene Roddenberry's space exploration saga over George Lucas's space opera any day of the week. But it was actually a different series in the former's franchise that I watched first since its episode count was much less intimidating. In hindsight, this wasn't a good idea as far as spoilers were concerned, but I was able to ignore that long enough to decide it was totally worth spending the next two months binging on all 80 episodes of the original series on Netflix afterwards. And so, here's to you, Aaron, for making me a full-time trekker. Live long and prosper, my friend. It's time to seek out some underrated new life and new civilizations with Star Trek The Animated Series, first airing from 1973 to 74 and recommended for viewers 8 and up. By the 23rd century, the humans and aliens of the Milky Way galaxy have come together to establish the United Federation of Planets, an interstellar government which strives to maintain peace between all forms of intelligent life. To strengthen such relations, they have sent out a Starfleet crew in the Federation vessel, the USS Enterprise, led by the steadfast Earthman, Captain James T. Kirk, on a five-year mission to explore space. The Enterprise crew encounter and befriend a variety of beings, some strange and intriguing, others as old and wise as creation itself, and experience cosmic phenomena both wondrous and perilous, while facing off against sworn enemies like the cunning Romulans and the deadly Klingons, all in their quest to share what they know and learn what they can, so that they may protect the universe and all its myriad races. 
Believe it or not, there was a time when the future of Star Trek was threatened by low ratings. Only a massive fan mail campaign ensured TOS a third season at all, yet no number of letters could save it from an unceremonious cancellation in 1969. But then, syndicated reruns began. All of a sudden, its popularity soared. Viewers from all over the country were crying out for more Star Trek. As neither another live-action show nor a feature film was a feasible option, creator Gene Roddenberry approved an animated show instead. Not to be confused with 2021's Lower Decks, this first animated spinoff is a direct continuation of the live-action series of the 60s and brought back nearly all of the main cast to voice their reprised roles. William Shatner as Captain Kirk, brave, earnest, and fully dedicated to his mission to preserve and protect. Leonard Nimoy as the ever-impassive and logical Vulcan First Officer, Spock. DeForest Kelly as Chief Medical Officer Leonard McCoy, aka Bones, who brings a human heart to his high-tech healing. James Duhon as Chief Engineer Montgomery Scott, or Scotty, to whom the Enterprise is both family and home. And Miguel Barrett as Bones' loyal assistant, head nurse Christine Chapel. Initially, only these five were to return due to budget concerns, but Nimoy firmly refused to participate, unless African-American Nichelle Nichols as communications officer Nayota Ahura, as compassionate as she is intelligent, and Japanese-American George Takei as the calm, collected, and informed helmsman Hikaru Sulu were brought back as well. He argued that not only were they two struggling for work at the time, but to leave them out would deny the very principle of inclusion and racial diversity the first show stood for. Needless to say, this was quickly rectified. But I'd be remiss for not mentioning Walter Koenig, whose Russian character, Ensign Pavel Chekhov, was unfortunately cut. As compensation, he was asked to pen an episode, The Infinite Vulcan, with the added bonus of the Retla plant as a tribute and fun little Easter egg, Retla being his first name spelled backwards. On a similar note, Spock was sadly the only non-human crew member of the Enterprise in TOS, half-human heritage aside. This was resolved with the addition of two new recurring alien characters. One was Lieutenant Eriks, a tripodal endosian. If E.T. was man-sized and thinner, with bright orange skin, three arms and legs each, and a high trumpet-like voice, he'd be something like Eriks. He is usually seen at the helm alongside Sulu. The other was Lieutenant Merez, an attractive felinoid female of the Katian race. She sometimes takes over for Uhura as communications officer and strongly resembles a lion, sporting golden brown fur, a tufted tail, a mane-like hairstyle, and a soft, husky voice often punctuated by strong purring. Unlike its predecessor, this was a half-hour Saturday morning cartoon for all ages rather than an hour-long drama for teens and adults. It was animated by the now-defunct Filmation, well known for producing its shows as quickly and cheaply as possible via limited animation. TAS was no exception. Of particular note, fixed stock shots of characters are plentiful, movement only coming from mouths and eyes, including Spock's famous raised eyebrow, with the former sometimes hidden entirely by hands or extreme close-ups. While matching the relatively blank faces to vocal emotions is seldom problematic, this can unfortunately cause the few legitimate facial expressions to appear sickly or even creepy. But let's give some credit where it's due, shall we? The actors' likenesses are very accurate, and the rotoscoping of the Enterprise blueprints created for TOS more authentically captures the ship's meticulous details. Besides, it's not like we sharp-eyed cartoon connoisseurs haven't seen recycled footage before. Just look at classic Hanna-Barbera and Disney, not to mention dozens of anime, both old and new. But what TAS may have lacked visually, it made up for narratively. Animation offered a creative freedom TOS couldn't afford, allowing for new worlds, scenarios, and of course, aliens, that would have been too costly and impractical for live action. Examples include Kirk and Spock being turned into water breathers by the reclusive fish-like inhabitants of Argo, a bombardment of planetary radiation which causes the crew to shrink rapidly, Bem, the arrogant colony alien commander of Pandro who selfishly uses his separation ability to trick Kirk, and an alternate time-reversed universe which regresses the crew into children. Strangely, the greatest controversy surrounding TAS doesn't revolve around quality or content, but rather its status as franchise canon. Why? Because it's a cartoon? But rather than going all Trekkie stereotype on everyone, I'm going to calmly and logically point out that not only is Roddenberry himself credited as creative consultant, but TOS head writer Dorothy Fontana has gone on record saying that this show is effectively the previous show's fourth season. Plus, when Filmation co-founder Lou Scheimer initially proposed to make TAS exclusively educational for children, Roddenberry put his foot down. Either make it like the old show, or don't make it at all. But of course, the new show still needed the 70s equivalent of a TV7 rating. 
I think this is TAS's most impressive aspect, being more family-friendly without sacrificing what TOS fans loved. The cast's traits, personalities, and interactions are spot on, right down to the legendary bickering between Spock and Bones. The show did offer elementary science lessons to explain as well as complement the exciting Saturday morning dilemmas. But like its predecessor, TAS was never afraid to offer its younger audience social commentary few other children's shows at the time would dare touch. Ahura, a black woman, once commands the Enterprise when all its male crew are incapacitated by siren-like beings. Pet euthanasia is addressed through a young Spock bidding farewell to his beloved Selat, Aichaya. But arguably the most provocative is when Kirk defends the satyr like Lucian, implied to be the devil himself, as a fellow living being. It was this exact mature writing which scored the franchise its greatest achievement up to then, the 1974 Emmy for Outstanding Children's Program. The submitted episode, Sharper Than a Serpent's Tooth, uses the conflict between the crew and the Mayan wyvern-like deity, Kukulkan, to illustrate the somber truth that children can't stay dependent on their elders forever, no matter the latter's good intentions, lest the former lose the ability to think and learn for themselves. I'm really glad this series was seen for the artistic goldmine it was, rather than just the literal one. More elements from here than I can name have since been adopted and utilized in future spin-offs and films, from the Next Generation series in the 90s all the way up to J.J. Abrams' 2009 reboot and beyond. I believe that this, along with the aforementioned credits, should be proof enough of its rightful place in Star Trek lore. But regardless of the canon debate, all of the original show's thrilling action, stimulating concepts, and admirable character development abound in Star Trek The Animated Series, the little sci-fi cartoon that helped its franchise help future generations boldly go where no imagination had gone before. Gather around next time for another tale you may have forgotten or have never heard before. Until then, listeners, may inspiration always find you. Greetings, listeners, and thank you for joining me once again as we celebrate stories and storytelling in all their forms and the bards and artists who bring them all to life. I am the Tale Collector and your host, Erica Adams. In the fall of 2017, I uploaded a YouTube video link to Facebook to highlight the anniversary of a bizarre event, the mystery of which continues to this day. I wasn't expecting much in response to the post, though. Enter Jesse Lowell Annold. Not only did he acknowledge the event with as much gusto as I, but he announced that he had made his own full-length film about it. Unsure what to expect, but unable to resist, I clicked the link he provided and watched. To say I was impressed is an understatement. This is the first time I've featured a shorter independent film that is solely online, creator-funded, and has very little in terms of traditional information and marketing besides a few small pages on IMDb, YouTube, and Facebook. But the production quality and the way it pays homage to its surreal source material makes it well-deserving of a place here. Prepare yourself for Intrusion. Released online in 2017 and recommended for viewers 17 and up. Gary, his girlfriend Laura, his brother Ed, and their mutual friend Will are four fun-loving roommates living in the suburbs of 1980s Chicago. One way they get their kicks is to record funny VHS tapes of each other. It is during one such recording that they reminisce about the numerous crazy and outrageous pranks they pulled off in high school. 
but Ed is far from satisfied. He proposes a new stunt to the gang that would blow their previous practical jokes right out of the water. Hijack Chicago television in costume and prank the viewing audience on a citywide scale. The other's nostalgic yearning for their mischievous glory days trumps all fear of jail time. But what Gary, Laura, and Will see as simply the ultimate prank is much more to Ed. In his own increasingly paranoid mind, it is a way for him to seize power from the government pigs warping the masses for their own gain. And while the group may be able to evade the authorities and keep their roles in the hijacking a secret, they may not escape the lethal repercussions when one of their own begins to mistake TV fantasy for dangerous reality. Chicago, Illinois, November 22, 1987. WGN-TV had just begun its recap of the latest Chicago Bears game on the 9 o'clock news when suddenly the screen went black. Fifteen seconds later, a figure dressed as fictional 80s icon Max Headroom appeared, bobbing his head erratically to the accompaniment of shrill buzzing. This unauthorized transmission was cut off after 28 seconds when officials were finally able to switch frequencies. But this oddball show was not over yet. At around 11.20 p.m. that same night, local PBS station WTTW was broadcasting the Doctor Who serial Horror of Fang Rock when Max struck again. Now featuring heavily distorted audio, he began spouting apparent nonsensical gibberish while fiddling with a Coke can and a gardening glove. This went on for some time before the shot cut abruptly to Max's partially exposed buttocks, which were then spanked by a female accomplice with a fly swatter. After a full 90 seconds on the air, the hijackers stopped transmission of their own accord, leaving viewers and TV personnel alike utterly baffled, and were never seen or heard from again. Such is what is now dubbed the Max Headroom Incident. As of 2021, over 30 years later, the hijackers' identities and motives remain unknown. Max is neither the first nor the last TV pirate to crash the screens of unsuspecting audiences over the years. But unlike Captain Midnight or Vrillon of the Ashdar Galactic Command, the memorability of this incident comes not only from the lack of apparent reasoning behind it, but from its obvious creative effort and presentation. These factors opened up a wide range of movie plot possibilities. Intrusion itself is equally unique because, as far as I know, it's one of, if not the first, found footage film that is historical fiction but without the documentary format. Before I continue, I'd like to thank Mr. Arnold himself for generously providing me with the background information on Intrusion. First conceived as a 10 to 15 minute short film, he decided to make it feature length when he realized how he could expand and explore his initial idea. Besides writing and directing, he also plays Will, and like the movie's quartet, he and his fellow cast members were and are still very close. Emily Morris, who plays Laura, he had known for 15 years, Max Duane, who plays Ed, he had known for three, and Brian Hamilton, who plays Gary, he had only just met, but with whom he also became fast friends. Though the story is set in Chicago, filming was done over a two-week period in Brooklyn and Manhattan, New York, exclusively in either close-knit single spaces or indistinguishable outside locations. Anhold was inspired to make intrusion when he found himself in what many call the YouTube rabbit hole, having come across the original hijacking and subsequent news cover footage after hours of bored video browsing. And I can personally attest to the stimulating benefits of hours of bored video browsing. Another inspiration came from family stories of the crazy pranks pulled off by his uncle Mark in high school back in mid-1970s St. Paul, Minnesota. Every one of the meticulously planned stunts described by the characters, except the illegal ones of course, Mark actually performed himself in real life. From the releasing of thousands of crickets in the cafeteria to the supposed fatal fall from the library's top floor. If I have one disappointment, it's that the hijacking itself, once concluded, is more or less forgotten. I would have liked to see the characters maybe watching the real-life news coverage of the incident and witness their reaction to riling up the public in such an elaborate fashion. That said, the group watches another piece of unrelated but just as shocking real-life news coverage of then-Chicago Mayor Harold Washington's death by heart attack just three days after the hijacking. This is cleverly worked into the plot to create a sense of dread as to what consequences, if any, may have been set into motion as a result of the group's juvenile delinquency. On that note, according to Annalt, the true horror of intrusion comes from not knowing whether what one is experiencing is real or not. This is especially intriguing considering this is no supernatural movie. The original Max Headroom hijacking video alone has its own surreal quality, from the unexpected appearance to the hazy technical quality to the sheer apparent madness of the hijacker's actions, which could certainly unnerve anyone not in on the joke. Anhold applies this concept to both his story and his characters, particularly the resonant outcast, Ed. 
It is never revealed what specific mental illness he has, but I was told it would be undiagnosed Asperger's, a neurodevelopmental autism spectrum disorder that causes difficulties in social interaction and nonverbal communication without significantly impairing language and intelligence, all of which is exacerbated by severe narcissism. Upon watching Intrusion, my friend and colleague, Sean, astutely commented that it was very discouraging to see Ed's views on political corruption and media manipulation, not untrue in real life, brushed off because of how his overzealous ways paint him as a stereotypical crazy conspiracy theorist, besides illustrating a sad truth about how little those with mental illness are heard or taken seriously. This creates a vicious cycle. The less understood Ed feels, the more he retreats into his disturbed mind. As soon as he dons the Max Hedrum mask, he will pointedly ignore his friends unless they finally address him as such. Or worse, in a manner reminiscent of Joseph's famous wolf mask scene from the 2014 film Creep, say nothing at all and just stare at the one behind the camera in a tense and eerie silence. In a way, it is the group's very closeness that works against them as Ed's sanity deteriorates. Gary, as the responsible older sibling, takes for granted that he knows Ed too well to fear him, chalking up his bad jokes as just the antics of the quintessential goofy kid brother and even showing some playful pride in that. But this only makes Gary the most reluctant to accept that there is anything wrong. Laura has the weakest bond and fewest emotional ties to Ed, enduring him mostly for the sake of Gary. While this results in less development of her character compared to the boys, she does give what little screen time she has her all, doing her best to be a loving and supportive girlfriend without sugarcoating the alarming facts Gary has to face about his brother. I would argue that Will has it the hardest of all. As Ed's childhood friend, Will is the most confused and hurt when even small talk with him results in either enraged political ranting or eerie cryptic declarations. Will's anxiety is distressing as he bears his soul at the camera when he thinks he's alone, divided as to whether his admiration and loyalty are worth the emotional abuse. The ending credit song effectively sums up this feeling of entrapment and regret. Anthony Trusolino, assistant director and lead singer of Brooklyn punk band Tired Radio, composed and performs a cover of the 1985 Tears for Fears hit, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. Despite its slower rhythm and more surreal tone, this instrumental techno synth version retains the original's nostalgic and retrospective elements, made more so when its somber lyrics regarding human nature are kept in mind. When I asked Anhold why he included this song, he simply told me to pay particular attention to the original's first two lines. Welcome to your life. There is no turning back. Though neither technically nor shockingly perfect, it's obvious that Intrusion was a labor of love by those who relish both a good creepy mystery and a good time with best friends. Besides a solid exploration of one of the most fascinating mysteries in television history, it's quite possibly an even better character study regarding mental illness and the devastating effects media can have on the psyche. Was this perhaps what the real Max was trying to tell his viewers all those years ago? Was there truly some hidden message for humanity behind the visual lunacy? Or was he nothing more than a skilled but immature man-child, with too much free time on his hands and a weird desire to give the TV bigwigs a collective heart attack? As an innocent and totally not subliminal little lollipop commercial once said, The world may never know. Gather round next time for another tale you may have forgotten or have never heard before. Until then, listeners, may inspiration always find you.